Sego and Ibuzu. Good afternoon, everybody, and we're going to get started right now. So thank you for joining us today for the Ontario Feder Federation of Labor's First Nations Métis and Inuit Circles Watch Party and Discussion Panel. My name is Krista Maracle, and I am a Mohawk from Tainanaga. I am the Vice President representing First Nations Métis and Inuit people here at the OFL, the Chair of the Ontario Public Service Employees Union Indigenous Circle, and a Senior Medical Laboratory Technologist at the University of Health Network in Toronto. We will be recording this session so it can be viewed later, just so that everybody knows. On June 21st, Canadians celebrate National Indigenous Day to honour the unique heritage, diverse cultures, and outstanding contributions of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. The Truth and Reconciliation Report highlighted the struggles Indigenous people have faced due to colonialism, residential schools, the 60s scoop, broken treaties, and the Indian Act. On June 21st, National Indigenous Day, let's recommit ourselves to writing a different narrative by celebrating Indigenous culture and daily acts of reconciliation. Last year, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirited People issued its long-awaited report that characterizes the violence inflicted against Indigenous women, girls, and 2SLGBTQIA people as genocide. We each must take action in our communities to implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirited People. Today, in celebration of National Indigenous Peoples Day, the FNMI Circle of the Ontario Federation of Labour has decided to host this watch party of the film Invasion, which highlights one of the struggles that Indigenous people face on a daily basis. As we watch the film, we have some questions we would like you to think about that will be part of our discussion panel. We ask that you put your answers and any questions in the Q&A box for our moderator to read out. So I'm gonna go on to uh, three of the questions that we're going to be asking. So number one, what is the colonial history of this region? Who occupied these lands before establishment of the current borders and national government? Two, what does anti-colonial struggle look like in this area? Are there any active anti-colonial struggles going on? And three, what projects are you currently engaged with that could benefit from applying more of an anti-colonial lens? What would this actually look like in practice aside from just token acknowledgement? Now I'm going to pass this to Dawn, another member of our FNMI circle to give you the final three questions and to introduce the film. Uh, this is being brought to you via a video link. Now in neglect. My name is Dawn Belrose. I'm from QP and I'm the Indigenous Council representative and I'm a member of Festival First Nation. Um, I'd like to uh, read you some more questions that will be uh, open for discussion following the movie. So what are some of the practical things that non-Indigenous activists should know about when working with Indigenous groups or Indigenous-led campaigns. The next one, what financial institutions, politicians, or corporations based in your community are supporting the destruction of the Wet'suwet'en lands? And finally, what are some of the ways of demonstrating material support for the Unistotin and the Wet'suwet'en? And how can you support Wet'suwet'en sovereignty from your stand. So this film is called Invasion. It is about the Unistoten camp, Gidimetan checkpoint, and the larger Wet'suwet'en nation, standing up to the Canadian government and corporations who continue colonial violence against Indigenous people. The Eunice Staunton camp has been a beacon of resistance for nearly 10 years, and it is a healing place for decolonization. The violence, the environmental destruction, and the disregard for human rights following the TC Energy, formerly the Trans Canada, and the Coastal Gaslinks Interim Injunction has been devastating to endure, but this fight is far from over. Thank you and enjoy the movie.
that they always come and interrupt our prayers, our eating. And just did the time up. Okay, good morning. What's up? We have a complaint that there was a box on the bridge. I didn't see no box. It's the box right there that was painted black. And the young girl at 8.30 came this morning and removed it. She just said it had kindling in there. Maybe somebody forgot it when we are doing ceremony last night. Okay. Because we got complaints that there was lots of activity on the bridge last night. Ceremony. Look at the flags. We did a water ceremony because they're trying okay. to destroy our water. I'm just getting annoyed of their okay. bullshit tactics. They're making us, trying to make us look bad and send you guys all the time. And every time they do stuff to us, it takes you guys two hours to get here. So you're blessing the water last night on the bridge? Or? We're doing prayers for the water because it's okay. in danger right now. Because of this BS that's happening right now. It's not just this. They destroyed our traps, destroyed our trap line. Conservation wouldn't come till they already cleared. All of this adds up. And you got to understand our frustration. We've been here since time immemorial before anybody came to these lands and your law can bend the rules to let somebody come in and destroy our land. And you get you guys to help them. If it was your house, you'd feel the same if the same vandals keep coming and wrecking your shit and nobody's doing anything. I was here 10 years and it took a long time to put these stuff up. They're here one week and they want to destroy it all. Nowhere in the junction does it tell them they can freaking ruin my stuff. I'm pissed. time in front of your face. Thinking of what are some of the, the challenges and also positive things that have come out of the last year? Well, in the last year, it's been busy. needs to stand up not just indigenous people everybody needs to stand up to the political powers that be that they need to change and quit making legislation and policies to make us look like criminals when we're just trying to protect what is ours it's not just this little courthouse the whole world is watching what Canada is doing what the province of BC is doing they haven't done their job they're skirting the responsibility over to industry and I know I'm doing the right thing. It's good to see some more with two attend. Yeah. <laughs> there were tons. Okay. There you yeah. go. And they were building yeah. they were building all of them. Oh boy. That's sad. <laughs> There's some bannocks there and some mace heart and uh, chili. Oh, hey, there's a plate if you like. Great. Do Esla. 
I'm sorry, I don't understand. Get him then, Bianca. My name is Vic and I'm with the Coastal Gasland Project. And the reason for Mr. Couture to be here is yes. to post the injunction that was granted by the BC Supreme Court mm -hmm. to allow us access to do the work. Canadian uh, courts do not have any jurisdiction on Wet'suwet'en territories. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have full jurisdiction. We have for thousands of years since time immemorial. We have never ceded or surrendered any of that jurisdiction. So I'm not here to argue that point with you. So, so um, we're going to post the injunction. You're not going to allow us through to get to the bridge um, with what, what uh, access we have or what... Uh... I have nothing stopping you from accessing the bridge. On the other side of the bridge is a different territory. This is Gidimdan territory. Remove us forcibly from our lands with your rifles, with your semi-automatic weapons. Nothing has changed in 150 years. keeping our eyes on the planned demonstrations across the country, all in support of anti-pipeline protesters in British Columbia. 14 people were arrested at the protest site late yesterday. That sparked a stand of solidarity across the country. Rallies were staged in dozens of cities, even some in the U.S., in support of the anti-pipeline protesters. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau could face heat over the issue tonight. He's in Kamloops, B.C., hosting a town hall. Trudeau has made improved relations with Indigenous people a core priority of his government. Um, you in the striped scarf. Yes. Hello. My name is Tilly. I come from the Statlium Nation. I want to ask you, what are you going to do to stop oppressing and holding our people under um, your, your colonization. When are you gonna give us our rights back? When are you gonna start giving a shit about who we are as people and not seeing us just for our land? I believe that the conflict that you're making it into out west with helicopters flying overhead and, and paramilitary showing up with assault rifles is uh, appalling. And so I'm more or less here to tell you that that's shameful. What you did to the Una Stoughton, that's a national disgrace. Shame. January 7th was a, was a national disgrace of Canada. It's inspiring to see the support worldwide that we have. And it's not just our Indigenous people that are standing up, it's people all around the world are concerned about the environment and concerned because they know it impacts them no matter where they live. So yeah, with that injunction and such low numbers out here, all of the Wet'suwet'en chiefs, because of what happened at 44, were afraid for us that were still up here at the camp and they didn't want any of us to get hurt. So out of fear, they made their decision to get us to stand back. And we made a decision that we not, it was too demoralizing that we weren't gonna take down those gates. If they wanted them down, they had to do it. This is my people's land way before the settlers came here. And you think you have a right to come on our land and destroy it? It's not right. My people have history here. 
The partners that have signed, they have no history here. And I hope you can go home and sleep tonight. We started coming back here in 2009 when we wanted to put a cabin here and realized that we safely could drink this water, so this became our prime point um, where we want to spend more of our time. This is the proposed corridor for multiple pipelines and we decided to move out here because we realized we couldn't protect our territories from afar. We're two hours away and because they kept on trying to come in, Who are you? My name is Rod. Where are you from? I'm with Chevron, representing the Pacific Trail Pipeline Project. We're here today because we'd like to do work on the territory. And we're requesting access to the territory here today so that Wet'suwet'en people can work and see the benefits from our project. We've already said no to these projects and that no pipelines will come on our territory. And we only have two territories left out of all our territories because of other people occupying our lands and agriculture, municipalities. All we have left is two areas and this is one of them. We hunt, we fish, we trap. This is our critical infrastructure. So what you're telling us is that you will not allow us access onto the territory. We understand that. We thank you for your time here today. Mm -hmm. We brought you an offering. We will have some water, some um, tobacco. No, thanks. Leave. We've got clean water right there. That's what we drink, and that's pollution, the plastic that adds to the landfill. The fifth meeting of the 18th session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues is called to order. I am Frida Hewson of the Unistat Dan, with Sioux and people of Canada. I am here today to express concerns for human rights violations happening to my people. This year, a pipeline company forced a court injunction on us, and if we stop them from entering our territory because they don't have consent, we face arrests. We have not been able to hunt or gather our traditional foods. The company has security and police force for keeping us from exercising our Indigenous rights. Elders, women, and healing center clients have been threatened with arrests for accessing our own territory. The pipeline company is violating Wet'suwet'en law, trespassing on our territory and starting to destroy the land. They have already destroyed the heritage site. After bulldozing part of the forest, we searched through the piles of dirt for evidence of my people. We found artifacts. The archaeology branch of the government and police assistance came in and took the artifacts and then released news bulletins claiming the artifacts were not from their original place. They are trying to erase us from our own land. All these acts that continue are the acts of genocide. I am here today to make a UN aware of our continuous genocide happening in Canada and to demand that our Indigenous rights and laws are respected. We're wondering why our own people weren't standing up beside us. And the more and more we realize that a lot of my family, the ones that are standing up, all the females in my family, we've done a lot of healings in our lives. We've gone through the same trauma as everybody else on our reservation. So that's the reason why we're able to stand up and stand up against what we know is wrong. So that's why we identified that other people aren't able to stand up because they're still stuck in their trauma and oppression. and everything that comes with being oppressed and living in a system that discriminates against you. So when my niece started going to school for clinical psychology, her long-term vision was to see a healing center on the land so that we could start healing our people. It took us four years to build the three phases of our healing center, which has a commercial kitchen, dining hall was built in the first phase, and then a rec room upstairs and food storage. And then the second phase included a boardroom. Uh, laundry room, 
an office and two counseling spaces and the third floor was a art room slash uh, workshop room. So that was the second phase that was put in and then the third phase was sleeping quarters. So this is the fourth year of work camp and it's pretty much done with just minor, small minor things. And then now the long-term goal is to add more cabins because for the healing center, we require a whole territory, all of Talbot's Plus to make this program successful. This is a new cabin being constructed by one of another significant site for our people. And this is the second one we're building to reoccupy another part of the territory. Beautiful scenery, tons and tons of medicine in this area. My dad always told me that the only way we're not gonna lose all our traditional territories, we have to reoccupy them. It's pretty much what settler people have done. They occupied our territories and now they call those municipalities and act like they own it, even though it's still with food and land. But he said we needed to reoccupy and behave like we own it because we do own it. We're behaving like we own these lands and we don't need nobody's permission to put up our cabins and we don't need nobody's permission to be here. We only go by our own with suit and laws. What do you think is gonna happen in the future in this land? The future I see is more and more of our people living in cabins all over this territory. More of our people getting thoroughly immersed in their culture becoming independent and harvesting their own food, their own medicine, so they can take care of themselves and their families. More and more other clans doing the same of what we're doing on their territories. The future I see is there will be no pipelines through here. The future I see there will be no man camp here. What are you afraid of? That's a trick question because I don't fear anything. Howdy, everybody. So my name is Daniel Stevens. Um, thank you for watching the video. Um, I will be your moderator today. Uh, and I'll start off by sort of introducing myself very quickly. I am a citizen of Nipsing First Nation. Uh, I am an OFL uh, member of the FNMI uh, circle there. I also am an OSSTF member and I work with the FNMI advisory work group uh, with that in that capacity. I also lecture and private consult uh, in Indigenous reconciliation for various uh, communities and universities and organizations. I also, uh, because I'm an OSSTF member, I'm a secondary school teacher and a, a huge uh, activist for uh, the disabled because of my fatherhood and my son. With me today, joining uh, with us through the airwaves uh, in Zoom is uh, Eve Saint. She's a Wet'suwet'en land defender. Uh, Eve was one of the four arrested in uh, Gitinim territory during the 2020 raids in Wet'suwet'en territory. She is the daughter of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief, uh, Chief Woos. I also have Sol uh, Mamakwa, uh, is a Kingfisher Lake band member and resident of Sioux Lookout. He is the MPP uh, for the Kiwetinong uh, writing of, uh, sorry, and the NDP critic for Indigenous relations and reconciliation. 
Uh, before being elected to office, Sol was the lead health advisor for the Shnabe Ashki Nation. I have Ron Russo also with us, uh, joining us from the Yukon, I believe. Uh, he is the Canadian Labour Congress VP for Indigenous Peoples and the President of the Yukon Federation of Labour. He is also a traditional dancer with the, uh, and I hope I say this correctly, uh, Darkwa uh, Kwan, Kwan Dance Group. So that sort of, uh, we watched Invasion, a very a powerful uh, movie uh, regarding sort of uh, what has happened in Wet'suwet'en territory. Um, and I think probably the best way to start off would be to sort of jump right into our first question uh, regarding uh, the, what, we are, what we're going to be discussing today is the sort of what, has, what is going on here in Canada, especially on the eve of uh national canada's national indigenous day i i say i say that that way because every day is indigenous day for us as indigenous peoples um but canada put a a, a side note on there for us on june 21st um and i'd like to start off with eve if you don't mind sort of handling the first question uh and maybe get the ball rolling again i ask everybody if you have any questions put them in the uh into the question and answer section and we will try to get them out uh, to the panelists as soon as we can. So Eve, what is the colonial history of your region specifically? I know there's always a lot of talk, we hear things on the news, I think it's important that we hear from the ground. What is actually, what is the colonial history of that region? Um, hi everyone. Um... Okay, so that question, um, just a little background on myself. I was raised in Toronto, and I'm kind of new to the Wet'suwet'en community. Um, just last year, uh, when um, Coastal Gasling got their interim injunction, that's when I went out to introduce myself. I just knew family prior to that. But um, this just comes to show on what happened just in the past like in the past 10 years or whenever um, like Una Stoden built their their healing center and have been occupying and reclaiming their land not just reclaiming actually I, I heard Freda and she was like we never gave up our land and so um, with what we saw happen back in February with the RCMP raids and the year before we, on Gidim Den um, the raids on Gidim Den, you can just tell um, Canada's treatment of Indigenous First Nations people and um, land defenders. And especially what we're seeing now through the pandemic, and I just wanted to um, express in my heart um, solidarity with our, our Black relatives and Black communities that are going through this violence and that um, uh, we see that in our communities too with the RCMP and that history with the RCMP is very violent and that's why they were created. They were created to uphold colonial law and uphold to keep us on reservations, to assimilate us, to take our children. Um, they have, they are no doubt involved in our missing and murdered indigenous women, sex trafficking, uh, rape, kidnap. So you can tell just by this, by their history, who's guilty. And we are criminalized for being indigenous. We are shot for being indigenous. And um, uh, it's just what we're seeing, nothing has changed. And um, it's just, it still goes on. I know that even after the raid, um, I mean, I was one of the four arrested. Uh, that was my father's territory, Get him uh, Den Camp is on, Camp 44. That's my father's territory. And um, it's still, the camps are still active. There are still people there holding it down, watching, watching um, as the workers work and uh, keep holding space. And I know that they're still harassed by the RCMP. Like when I was out there, I just got back from um, out west uh, just a couple days ago and we like are targeted, me and my partner, because they, they know who we are. They know that, um, uh, who my family is, and we get pulled over, we get followed, 
Um, they came, they come knocking on our doors, like just for whatever reason, um, just to check up on us. And um, there are some dark stories that go along with that. And this is the, the Canadian government, the Canadian government that's allowing this to happen. So, you know, celebrating <laughs> Indigenous Day. I know a lot of people do celebrate it and I don't look down on that. But to me, like that just seems like a slap in the face, especially with all the killings. Um, Chantal Moore and um, the others that have um, Everett Patrick and the others. Uh, we just keep on dying at the hands of the RCMP and um, I know that I, I, I don't have that privilege to walk around and not be afraid of the RCMP. And, um, and yeah. You know, yeah, and I think that's sort of, the, the, that's the general feeling. I'd like to hear from Ron, uh, um, sort of the same question. Uh, you know, what's the history of colonialism up in the Yukon? We don't generally hear a lot about that in the news as to sort of what happens, but there is a deep story there from what I understand. You know, as I just like to sort of step back, you know, as, uh, you know, as I live inside of the, uh, the northwest coast of Turtle Island, and on my head is a cedar woven uh, headpiece, a shakiat. And what it is, it's, it's from the north coast and it's woven, and it was cedar that has been used forever. I'm wearing a, a, a north coast of uh, the island traditional button blanket. You know, it is, it's such an important part. But you know, it's it's, it's part of, of who I am. But I'd also like just step back because you know, is I'm I'm Anishinaabe. I'm from Ontario. Uh, I I was born in the '60s. My mother packed up three young children and moved across the country because of residential school and the '60s scoop. She moved to get us away and protect us. And you know, we grew up not talking about you know who we are and and where we're from until, you know, I started getting involved and, you know, through my union and, and where I'm at, uh, you know, and my children are, are up and asking questions. You know, my grandson's grown up with a, with a deep history, which, which I'd lost and never had. So I think it's really important to look at that. But, you know, as I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the Wet'suwet'en territory, because of, you know, people talking about, you know, the hereditary chiefs, you know, is I'd like to talk a little more about that because, you know, the chief and electoral system that's currently in came inside of 1969. And it was part of the Indian Act, you know, because it was to assimilate and take what we were as a people, which was mainly a matriarchal system, where we looked to our, our women and our elders to, to make movements forward to a colonial system where you had to be a male of 23 to vote and took away our complete system of governance that we've had for thousands of years into something that you know the, the colonialism thought would be better for us and would make it easier for us to be uh, brought in. So you know, is when we we heard lots of stories in the middle of this talking about you know hereditary chiefs. Well, you know what? I believe that the hereditary chiefs are the chiefs that should be looked at because they're the ones that were selected. They were the ones that were put forward by you know, the elders in the community, not through an election system that was forced upon us by a colonial government. Uh, you know, is, is the land is never been ceded. The land is, is part of it. And, and even when it is ceded, it was taken by force. So, you know, is, I, I really enjoyed the, the film and, uh, you know, being you know, linked so closely with, with where I've grown up since I've been very, very young. Is, it's important, and it's important that we stand up and we defend uh, our rights as, as, in, as Indigenous people and, and stand behind. Because, you know, when we look at, uh, at how we can come together, you know, we, we heard Eve talk about, you know, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter that just is, is happening, you know, is, is we need to defend them and they need to defend us. And, and you know, is, it, it really goes a long ways when, when we all stand together. So, I think I'd kind of go from there and uh, look forward to the questions that are coming out. Thank you very much. 
Seoul, same thing. I know coming up from Sioux Lookout, it's, it's close to my territory, which is the Robinson Huron territory. Uh, and then you're up in uh, Robinson Superior and, and Treaty Number uh, 9 or 11 in that area. Uh, and if you don't mind giving us a sort of, you know, what the history of colonialism looks like up there. So, uh, uh, greetings everyone. Uh, again, great. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Saul Mamako. I'm the member of Provincial Parliament for the Kiwetinook Riding, which is north, means north in our language. Um, certainly, uh, from where I come from, uh, from Northwestern Ontario, it's a, uh, a riding that was created uh, back in 2018, uh, whereby, um, you know, whereby there's uh, there's a high population of First Nations Indigenous people in, in those communities. So um, being one, uh, one of the 124 MPPs that are uh, MPPs in, in, uh, in the provincial Ontario uh, legislature, it's, it's an honor to represent First Nations. And uh, it's never, uh, uh, I know for me as an Indigenous person, as a First Nations person, as an OGP person, from Kingfisher Lake, you know, it's an honor to be rep to represent Indigenous people. I know uh, the structure that I'm in is a, a colonial structure. I see it every day. I work with it every day, and uh, it's not a system that was built for us. Uh, I know uh, previous to that, uh, I did a lot of uh, health policy work, health, health administration, and dealing with uh, some of the um, colonial legislation legislations that were coming down the pipe regarding health. And I know that uh, the, the area I represent uh, is um, part of the treaty number nine, uh, but also a uh, treaty number five and also treaty number uh, three areas. So um, uh, from where my home community of Kingfisher Lake, uh, you know, uh, there are signatories to treaty number nine uh, signed in 1905, and, but also uh, adhesion at 1929. And it's a, uh, you know, it's one of the, uh, when I said I'm glad that I'm representing First Nations, Indigenous people as well, I mean, in the Ontario legislature, it is a, uh, 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 out of the one, out of the one to 11 treaties, um, that were signed by, uh, that were signed. Um, number nine is the one of the ones that had uh, Ontario signed on to. And there's, we're supposed to be true partners, uh, not stakeholders to the system, but they treat us like stakeholders when I'm in the house. And I think uh, one of the things I deal with because I'm in a provincial parliament, one of the things I face is certainly um, um, the colonial, uh, not the colonial, but the jurisdictional ambiguity, the jurisdictional ping pong that uh, the governments play, federal and provincial, on the lives of, uh, lives and the health of the people in Ontario. Not only that, but my writing as well. And I know that's one of the things that's very, uh, I get frustrated at that. And then I know it's a very, I don't know how to say it. Uh, it's almost like we're, in, we're not even part of Ontario. You know, it's a different Ontario. It's a different Canada just because of who we are and who we are as, you know, with the light skin, like the less skin and uh, because we're, we live off reserve, there's different rules for us. And because of those colonial laws, colonial programs, systems of, uh, you know, whether it's uh, child welfare, whether it's a uh, uh, justice system, whether it's the healthcare system, whether it's uh, education, where, you know, the systems that are there, like these systems are not broken. They're not broken. They're actually working exactly the way they're designed to, which is to take away the rights of the people that live in those communities, the rights to the lands and the resources that are there. That the system is, that, that's how it's built. And, but I think uh, that's something that uh, I've learned to, you know, like worked under, worked under, I see it, and I see how it impacts the lives <clears throat> and the health of our people. And that's what's happening in the region with respect to, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, the lands that are there. Like uh, we have, like uh, when I was looking at the, uh, the, 
you know the the you know the the movie the 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 land uh, who we are and the way of life for our people comes from the land the language comes from the land and you know who are we without the land so that's why it's so important to be able to protect and occupy these lands and use them as as our our uh, forefathers uh, use them so it's it's uh, that's how that's how we will get uh, the healing the strength and uh, you know the hope that we have for our people miigwech Thank you very much, Saul. Um, we got a, we actually have a question from the floor, so we'll take a little bit of a side note here uh, from Mikala. Um, it's a two-part question. One is, um, what is the current situation, the lands in the movie? Uh, and I'd like to address that sort of uh, second, if you guys don't mind. Um, I'd like to throw it to, to Saul here to sort of maybe explain sort of the processes involved uh, in the second part of this question, which is, how could a BC court make such a decision in the first place? And is there a plan sort of to maybe retake or reoccupy or are there options uh, for the West Sudan people uh, is sort of the, I think the, the, the overall arching question. So Saul, would you mind taking that for us? I think in every aspect of the, where we occupy the land, we've been users of the land. And it's very important that uh, we have to recognize and acknowledge the people that live there and who occupied them before. I know we faced that in Northern Ontario too. Um, and it's a very similar to what's in the position that they take and the people that will take uh, the position that they will take, like for example, the Ring of Fire. I know some communities or uh, some communities are, uh, you know, they had a process on how to work together, make sure that they work together. And uh, this government, the conservative government had really, you know, uh, drop the ball and ripping up the agreement that they had before on the process protocols that they were, how they will work together. And I came up with a new process. And then I see that similar thing happening whereby, you know, like we protect, we always protect our lands. And I, I, I know when I talk to community people, residents of those communities, not necessarily leadership, but in leadership as well. And, you know, they, they will um, protect their lands without like it, because uh, you know their the way of life and the, the 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 way of life the language comes from the land so that's what we are protecting we're protecting the identity the language and the, the way of life of our people and it's very similar to uh, and i think uh the way the governments try to implement the rule of law is that not acceptable and uh, and i think uh one of the things that you know, and when we talk about reconciliation with indigenous people, it does that. It's failing. The governments are failing uh, with with that process, and those are my thoughts for now. Thank you, thank you, uh, Eve. Would you mind sort of giving us an idea of you know what's the current situation like today in uh, you know June twentieth, uh, twenty twenty. Uh, on the ground in BC, uh, do you mind sort of just maybe reframing it? Because, you know, COVID-19 has sort of taken a spotlight uh, on a lot of our lives, um, but we know that this is still going on. Uh, yes. Um, from my understanding, um, because I was on my way back for court, so I, um, after we got arrested, um, I went to my dad's for a bit because it was, um, it wasn't a safe situation for me to be back at the camp uh, just because of the RCMP was really heavily um, surveilling the territories and um, um, picking on uh, Wet'suwet'en people and their supporters. And so um, I came back to Ontario, uh, Toronto is where I live. And, um, and then I was on my way back and um, COVID hit, the pandemic hit, and um, we were on our way back for court. And um, I know that uh, CGL was still continuing um, work on the site. Um, they were still accessing the territories, even when the hereditary chiefs have called, because um, they were in negotiations with um, with Minister Carolyn Bennett and Mac Miller, um, they're supposed to seize 
work and um, because of the whole shutdown Canada. So that really helped um, go on to that next step. So there was negotiations um, of uh, trying to get back um, uh, rights to the hereditary chiefs uh, because Canada Supreme Court has recognized in the Dugamuk case back in the 90s that hereditary chiefs did not, um, the Wet'suwet'en did not surrender their land and um, that the, the decision makers are the hereditary chiefs. So, um, that, but that didn't stop uh, CGL from working. They still continue to work. I have been on the territory a couple times um, since. Um, and yeah, they're probably um, laying down the pipe, the pipeline. We saw a yard full of pipes um, being stored. And um, so hopefully I know that the people there on the ground, like Freda and Molly are really trying everything to look into to uh, stop, stop, uh, stop the construction and the work of the pipeline, but they are still um, going and accessing the territory along with the RCMP. Wow, okay. Um... So as you can see, you know they're they're moving forward with this. This is, hasn't this hasn't disappeared and isn't going anyway anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask Ron a quick question. Uh, something's come in from the floor again, uh, and I know we're sort of getting off topic from the six questions, but uh, I think we need to sort of talk about these these bigger issues at hand. Um, this is again it's a two part one, and and Ron, if you don't mind sort of fielding this, to be great. Um, how do we help to change the general public? You know, we, we always see things in the media, things like Dudley George, the Oka crisis, residential schools, um, things that have happened in the U.S. Uh, with their pipelines in South Dakota. You know, how do we sort of how do we sort of change that mentality? Um, I know you work a lot with labor. And one of the biggest questions that does come up a lot of times is, you know, these the, 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 there's sort of a, a similarity between the labor struggle and you know, you know, protecting our lands. There, there is some similarities that I think that non-Indigenous people may be able to sort of relate to and sort of maybe help our help these causes of, of, of protecting our territories. Yeah, I believe that one of the things that comes up is that people uh, need to be getting involved. People need to be talking uh, with each other. You know, instead of labors, is uh, we've come up with a, a few courses that have come out. Uh, you know, uh, uh, rights on Turtle Island, uh, a, a course called Turtle Island, where we sit down and talk about histories and what's going on and personal struggles. And, you know, inside of uh, the union which I come from, which is the Postal Workers Union, is we've taken that out across the country to, to thousands of people and really stepped it up. And, you know, people taking the information and going back and talking, not only on their work floor, but also to, you know, their community and their family and friends and you know, that's, that's really uh, stepped it up. You know, when we end up inside these, these big struggles is, is we need to uh, realize that, you know, even inside of our workplaces, you know, as we see the injustices of, of you know, Indigenous people not being hired, uh, you know, the employment equity, which still continues, and it, it's a fight. But, you know, unless we sit down, we talk about it, we make these issues public, you know, is uh, when we get involved inside of, the protests, you know, we saw Idle No More really hit. And when the Wet'suwet'en came in and, you know, we saw protests going across the country, you know, is those are, are what made this frontline news because if nobody showed up, is it would have been just a, a, a wash. It would have come in and gone. But, you know, as we saw the, the protests come up inside of, you know, Vancouver, Toronto, you know, small towns, uh, people getting up and speaking about it and speaking about what the issues were. Because if we don't speak about it, we're not going to get anywhere. And uh, it really came a long ways when, you know, we talked about, you know, protests going on for the Wet'suwet'en in other countries. Like, you know, it really sat down and pushed the envelope. Uh, you know, it brought up the conversation. And, you know, as, as we, we get negativity out of it. But I think that we, we just need to sit down. We need to explain. And we need to educate. And sometimes we don't need to get into the fight of, of, uh, of, of 
sitting down and, 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 and defending what we know is right. You know, as we sit down, we educate, we explain, and it goes a long ways. And I think that out of all of these uh, fights, it really steps up and holds the government accountable. And, and we've seen it, right? You know, the recognition of hereditary chiefs wasn't just because they had to, it's because they needed to. And it's really important that, you know, people get up and talk. You know, when we leave here, that we, we talk to their family, you know, we talk about what's going on, you know, because the, the, what's happening inside the wet suit, and there was so much public uh, 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 stuff put out against the wet suit, and, you know, by the people with the money. And I, I think that, you know, us speaking really sort of stepped it up. Is that kind of what you're looking for? That yeah, that's, I, that's, that's excellent, actually. Like, you know, I think that's where the biggest lens is, right? We, a lot of times they see, a, a, from my personal experience, is that there's a, there's almost like there's this, this, this compartmentalization that occurs. Um, you know, indigenous issues are one thing, and then, you know, labor movement is another. And there's a lot of, there is a lot of sort of crossover and similarities where if we could work together, uh, I think a lot of these issues could be pushed forward and, and pushed through to, to help to benefit everybody else. Um, I do have a question for Eve. Uh, this did come in here again from the floor um, from Anna. Um, has the government ever considered alternate routes uh, before approving this one particular route? Uh, yes. Um, from my understanding, I know that uh, the hereditary chiefs have offered an, an alternative route. Um, I, I, when I was at the um, when I was at the uh, uh, territory Unistodin, uh, they actually took me back to the uh, right of way pipeline where the pipeline route is um, currently um, being put. And um, I'll tell you, it was so beautiful. Like it took a while to get back there. So it, it was actually the holiday. There was no RCMP, no CGL workers, and um, it was just magnificent. The territory, at one point we were surrounded by like mountains. Uh, there was a caribou migration, migration trail. Um, and I know that out there, the caribou numbers are very low. Um, and from my understanding, I know that they're not, CGL isn't doing the best on, um, on protecting the habitat of animals like the grizzly and moose and etc so they were offered an alternative route and they denied it and they did it they just rejected the uh, route and um, just continued on with this one but it is really I didn't even know until after I, I made that stand on how beautiful it was I mean People, it's it's to die for, really. Um, yeah. Um, this is another floor question, and it kind of ties into what we are going to get into in the next little while about anti-colonialism. Um, this is from uh, Raji. So during the COVID, uh, Alberta's Kennedy uh, or Kenny, sorry, proposed uh, to do a so-called critical infrastructure bill to stop anti-pipeline and other protests uh, targeting Indigenous peoples. What are the ways in which settlers uh, from all over Canada can join to defeat this illegal bill and similar moves? And I think it ties into the, you know, what projects are people in this room sort of currently engaged in with that could benefit in applying more of an anti-colonial lens? Um, I think Saul is probably best, uh, if you don't mind, sort of fielding that question, is how can we, as Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people, sort of, you know, I don't, I not necessarily take down the the, the colonial the, the colonial perspective, but definitely sort of fight back on, you know, ensuring that our rights are are maintained through the processes. Certainly, I think um, not think, but I believe that the uh, uh, today or what's been happening over the last two three weeks with uh, with our uh, brothers in uh, south of the border with respect to the Black Lives Matter on what happened down there, but also what's been happening across uh, the country with uh, Indigenous people with our CMP. I think it raises a level of, uh, 
this systemic racism, the, the racism, the colonial structures that are there, where, whereby it has an, an impact on the lives and the health of our people across across our territories. And I think right like right now today, and that is happening, and like even more with uh, you know. Uh, uh, indigenous day like it's a, an opportunity to you know remember uh, recognize call out that these structures on the way they impact you know the way these systems are built to basically care our people and that, that these are the policies that are there and uh, and I believe that uh, we need to start uh, breaking down these colonial structures that are there. And one of the things I um, learned over the last two years and uh, being at Queen's Park, being at the Ontario legislature uh, in Toronto is, um, again, uh, these are colonial structures that, that, that these been built for you know hundreds of years and to, to, to kind of try and fall back and fall in line where even the basic human rights example is, you know, like I have one community uh, that has had 26 years of boil water advisory in Ontario, and that's the longest boil water advisory across Canada. And why is that? Is it, uh, that's what systemic racism looks like. And I think uh, when, like I've seen people, lobby lobbyists, uh, groups come to Queen's Park, they want to meet with me, whether it's an uh, uh, energy issue, whether it's, uh, you know, could be anything, right? And I know um, our communities, uh, I think we need to get our, uh, you know, we need as Ontarians, as Canadians, as First Nations, as Indigenous people, as As human beings, as human beings, we need to work together. And that's just so basic. And, you know, like we need, we can't treat, we have to treat everyone equal. And, um, and I think that's the first step and start calling out if there's any racism issues that are happening in front of you, in front of us, we need to stand up to it. We need to call it out. And it's not, uh, and I think uh, there are some, Yes, there's some colonial structures that are in place that, you know, whether it's by policy, whether it's by legislation, whether it's by funding, but also there's also statutes across, you know, uh, Canada. And I know one of the things when I walk to work every morning and I walk by Queen's Park, there's a structure there right at the head of Queen's Park. And it's Sir John A. McDonald. And sometimes I wonder, and I look up at him, and then uh, and uh, it's uh, you know uh, what's the history in that for First Nations people? What's the history behind this man that you know that's standing there? You know, uh, you know when we talk about uh, being an architect for colonization, when we talk about colon, you know, when we talk about residential school, sixty school, like all those policies, where did they come from? And it came from that man. And I think those are the hard discussions, you know, like that we as First Nations people need to stand up against. And uh, not only that, but we need to be true partners with uh, non-Indigenous people as well, uh, whether it's uh, calling out, you know, the inadequate the inequity that exists. And, uh, you know, everybody sometimes uh, always talks about diversity. Diversity is there unless there's justice, unless there's equity. And uh, right now, where we live in Ontario, where we live in Canada, we don't see that. And we can see that in many forms. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, today is the day it's, uh, you know, all what's happening across the globe. Not, I'm not talking about COVID, but, you know, like with the systemic racism issue and, you know, when Jack Mead stood up, you know, against the speaker and against, uh, you know, other, other MP, you know, 
and he gets pulled out for standing up for, you know, against, you know, racism. And that, and then that structure that's there just kicks him out. And I think that's a structure that we're, uh, and then how do we keep on moving in steps? Like, you know, whether we don't expect like a hundred, 80 degree change, we don't expect like a, a 90 degree change, but if we can change the trajectory of thinking of the people that are in power or even individuals, you know, a person that's sitting in their uh, living room in uh, Mississauga, somebody in, you know, in the if we can change that, like I think that's that is success, and I think we need to move forward in that. And it shouldn't take us, you know, like I remember talking to people like the, the colonial system that's here, we need to bring it back, but how do we bring it back? We're all inclusive, and and I think uh, again, we need uh, first nations need, um, I guess, the power and the authority on, on their own issues. And, you know, it talks about, uh, you know, we talk about uh, administration, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, resource allocation funding, like you know, those, like we're always underfunded, but it's kept, it's made to keep us where we are. And uh, so those are some, just some thoughts. I think, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm going to sort of frame a couple different questions and put them together now. And I'd like to get all of your sort of perspectives on this. Um, as a personal activist, I know sort of building capacity is a very, very difficult thing. And a lot of times, um, for example, and I use my son as an example, he is a, a, a disabled, nonverbal epileptic with severe developmental delays trying to push his voice and trying to push him to the forefront is always difficult because you're trying to get people who aren't necessarily in your situation to empathize, sympathize, and mobilize. And I think what happens is we, the panel is really great because it's a big mix of individuals who work uh, in parliament. We have uh, Eve, who is a very strong activist. And we have Ron who works within labor. We really have all three areas covered in this panel. And I would like to sort of frame the question as this is, how would you guys, how, what kind of practical things could non-Indigenous people do um, to get involved to sort of, you know, help bring uh, Indigenous rights to the forefront to help correct some of the, uh, um, some of the, the misguided information that's there to correct the issues and systemic racism that exists because most people get fed what is what is in the media and i know you guys are on the ground working hard on that and i was wondering if you guys could share some thoughts on how do you guys within your areas get people mobilized uh ron would you mind going first yeah as you know as, as we get up and we were uh through the dance group as we're out we're celebrating our our heritage we're we're going out and we're, you know, as, as we've done some really big performances, whether it be, you know, the opening of the 2010 Olympics, whether it be Japan or Taiwan, but the big things is, is the small local events and talking and celebrating who we are, our, our history, our vibrant culture that was taken away and taking it back. And, you know, is uh, explaining what's happened, right? Is whether it be inside of our unions, whether it be inside of our homes, is standing up and taking a stand when people say, you know, they, you know, is, is it's not their land, right? Or, or, or something as such, right? It's, it's getting up and, and defending, you know, is, is as we hear about, you know, what happened with Colton Boucher, you know, people sat down and said, oh, well, you know, he was, he was doing this, right? But, you know, nobody actually talked about him being a person and, and where it was going, you know, is all the way across this country, I believe that us getting up and speaking you know, people coming out and supporting us inside of rallies and events. You know, when we sit down and there's a, a rally going on and there's so many uh, people that are, are people of color and people of, uh, you know, without using the white folk coming out and supporting us really makes people get up and notice uh, because, you know, it, it shows that, that they understand it. And going home and them sharing exactly what they see. You know, is, is we talk a lot about politics. You know, we need to get up and we need to vote. We need to vote, you know, whether it be uh, us as Indigenous people, 
but also people getting up and voting around indigenous rights. Because if we sit down and we look at, 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 you know, the promises that have happened, right? As we talk about indigenous day, you know, the platform before this election, the election before. So we're looking back, you know, five years of them sitting back and saying that they're going to deal with national indigenous day. You know, the three territories, it's a holiday on Monday, but it's not in the rest of the country because they went through a whole mandate and haven't done it. You know, a day for us to celebrate, you know, a day for us to, to you know, embrace our, our heritage. And why is it not? I think that it's systemic. You know, I think it's, it's you know, them sitting back and, and not wanting to step it up. You know, when we look at what's happening, you know, inside of Alberta, you know, Alberta is, is not about, you know, uh, uh, anything but money politics and uh, power. It, it's about, you know, getting the oil going. And, you know, we, we need to be stepping away from that because, you know, we've seen you no know, Mother Earth start to heal inside of this pandemic, you know, with uh, birds and animals and, you know, being able to see across the city because of the pollution slowing down. You know, it, it's, it's really us getting up and us standing together and, you know, understanding you know who we are and stepping in to to help because you know when we sit down and, and we do that it's going to make a big difference and i believe that this next uh, federal election we need to be ready and we need to understand what these what these governments have done you know whether it be inside of alberta whether it be uh what's happening inside of uh the house right now we need to remember that when we go into an election, that we need to be standing together and we need to be looking for allies. And uh, talking about what's happening inside the wet sea wind, you know, it's so important, but that's where we can see the difference because it's, it's not gonna be given to us. Uh, we have to get up, we have to stand together and we need to take it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Saul, would you mind sort of talking sort of from a legislative uh, section apart on how do we get you know how do we get that empathy and that sympathy and that movement that Ron so clearly sort of talked about because um, I know that legislation will play a very key role in that um, one of the things um, I realized over the last uh, two years or so in uh, at Queen's Park and the people that I work with my colleagues uh, the MPPs and as indigenous people or even as you know from where we are geographically uh, in the riding of Kuwait Nook, not only that like even in Thunder Bay area Thunder Bay North and even uh, Timmins and that area right they they don't know who we are what we're about and uh, and the values and the teachings that we have they don't know that and I think uh, Sometimes what sometimes uh, happens is uh, we, um, the normals that we are aware of the system, the way the systems treat us in our communities and those settings, sometimes we normalize it, like not sometimes, but we normalize it then as First Nations people because we just accept it uh, as a status quo, as a, you know, as acceptable and normal. In, uh, in this province, in this in this uh, in Canada, so, and I think uh, with some of the things that I have seen is uh, you know like I hear a lot of stories from people. I hear a lot of truth-telling stories, and I think if you're a non-Indigenous person, you just have to believe those stories. You just have to hear us. You have to just, just listen to those stories, and some of the you know uh, inhumanity that happens in our communities, some of the inequalities and the inequities that exist uh, within these systems. And uh, like, you know, a simple thing, as I spoke about earlier, the, the access to clean drinking water. And, you know, um, that community I spoke about where, whereby they had 26 years, of, like they still have it, they still, of uh, water boiling advisory, water boiling advisory. So what, you know, uh, is it colonialism at work? Yes. Is it systemic racism? Um, yes. Is there reconciliation? No. These are 
the real things that are happening and then you know like at every level of uh you know uh whether it's uh, uh community level with at the program level with at the legislative level like there's tools there that we can use and whether it's uh speaking at the house or whether it, whether the question whether it's a uh, lobby is your groups come and you know this is what we're doing because we don't know people don't know in this place that colonial structure and like like as for this place was never built for indigenous people so we have to create find our space in there and that's one of the things i'm learning is finding our own space because I, I, I never plan to be a, i never never plan to be a politician i never plan to be an mpp but somehow work just got me here and then and then sure like i i learn from my colleagues but i'm still trying to find my own space where how do i fit in what change can i make and i think uh you know lobby days coming to queen's park as first nations people to find our own space and you know like i know um, there was a group from north uh northeastern Ontario, Saskatchewan. they had a flood last year uh, every year they have they have get, they get uh, evacuated and you know it's a community of 20 2500 people and you know, when you evacuate that number of people it's quite a bit of work but i know they were trying to look at different places and i remember they they came to queen's park while we were they were evacuated and and uh, i had prepared a question on what's going to happen and uh, so around nine, like question period starts at 10 30 and uh, uh, by about nine o'clock they start rolling in it was like at least 250 of them and the staff the security could not handle it even our uh, uh you know the legislature could not handle it because he just came in but when i got up to ask a question i could feel the uh, the people power that it uh, that it has to have people because like, it's that's why it's so important to uh, stand together and come together as one. And, and that's one of the things that colonization has done is separate us. And, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're meant to conquer and divide us. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's very important that we are, uh, that uh, we are united and that we are strong in the, in the, the efforts and the work that we not accept uh, this, uh, so-called reconciliation that people throw around because it becomes just a rhetoric for me when I hear people speak, uh, my colleagues speak about colonial, I mean, uh, uh, you know, reconciliation, you know, um, yeah, it's a, uh, so I think in moving forward, um, you know, just be there for us, just be an ally and uh, reach out to us, uh, send, send letters to your M federal MP uh, send your provincial MLA or uh, MPP about your issues on what's happening across the globe with the indigenous people because it's killing our people and it, uh, it's working exactly the way it's designed to so we have to help it. And I think that that's a, that's a huge point, right, is, is getting those voices. And I know a big part of activism is getting those voices. Um, Eve, if you want to sort of, can you sort of feel that part? Because there's a lot of emotion that goes into activism. There's a lot of sort of logistics and cold analytics in a lot of times on how to deal in getting people mobile and, and, and getting things off the ground. Yeah, um, just adding, just adding on to uh, Saul and Ron um, about um, just trying to like get people uh, motivated, aware. Um, I think we have to we have to kick it up a notch. We have there's the the days of peaceful holding signs and smiling and peace signs and flowers. Those days are gone. Like we have to kick it up a notch because like, this is how the system was built. I am um, that saying that you can't bring down the master's house using the master's tools, but like in a way we do have to exercise everything that we have, all of our resources, all of our people like Saul in um, taking his spot in, in, in the government. And, you know, we just need all these people. We need everything. Like we don't have the answers and actually like we shouldn't be 
like doing all the work and saying this is what we need to do because we don't have those answers we're still oppressed people but you we need to work together yes unity we need unity we need everyone like i would talk to doctors in healthcare and be like hey our lives are in your hands you need to make sure that these racist nurses and doctors do not um you know play with our lives or um just to defund the police. Yes, we do need to defund the police. We need to try to dismantle that racist structure, like sue them, like mid 2000s, the police, Toronto police broke into our home uh, without a warrant and we sued them. And I mean, just, we got to try everything. Like if, um, like we got to do ev like everything that we possibly can. I know it takes work and time. Yes, it does, but we got to start somewhere. Like even if it's um, starting like a cop watch in your neighborhood, because I know RCMP goes on the reserve and just kicks in doors without warrants. Like that has to stop. Like people have to know their rights. People have to, like we have to be seen as human beings again. You know, they say they do like the Canadian Canadian government, blah blah bullshit. Um, you know, we need our we need our educators. Our children need to learn our history, and that um, because we got to try to make our next generation aware. We got to still like um, this can't be Canada's secret anymore, and it's not. And we're we're starting to use our voice and our power with what I saw with Witsuotin and even Black Lives Matter, like you do have to kick it up a notch. You do have to be brave and use your voice, whether it's you're the only one who's in that seat and speaking up against a, a lot of white political, political men or women. Um, we just have to use everything. Newcomers, like I'm pretty sure they don't know our history. They think we get everything for free, <laughs> right? So I think exercising everything that we have, we have to get our policy makers and people who have power to influence. Um, we just kind of, yes, we do need everybody. There is, we have to take down these racial divisions, these racial walls between us because that is their power. That is what is keeping us divided. And just, it's, it's really using um, our power against us. So um, I just wanted to add that to to the oh, uh yeah ron ron would like to say something perfect thank you very much eve eve i have to thank you so much you know is is as we look back at, at our history you know inside of uh because this is a uh, ontario federation of labor is, is as we look back as our history as a labor movement is if it was not for people standing up you know standing up to the authority getting arrested you know, we would not be where we're at. You know, when we look at what happened with Jean-Claude Perrault, who got arrested for standing up for the labor movement, is, you know, we wouldn't have things such as, you know, our basic rights as, you know, maternity leave. That was not given, it was taken. And we stood up for it. And we need to stand up together. And, you know, is it takes a lot to be standing up to authorities. You know, a lot of us have been there standing up and doing it. And, you know, as I have to thank you for what you're doing. And, you know, as if there's anything that, you know, uh, we can do to help you inside of your, your, your legal struggles, because, you know, is it, it's what made the difference inside of where we're at today. It's not taking what they're giving us, it's we're standing up together. So thank you, Eve. Yeah, so I think part of getting organized, um, and I'm going to sort of, uh, uh, we all know that West Sudan isn't done. This is still going on. They require um, some financial help. Um, so I am going to, uh, we will try to update the Power for Many website uh, with a link there to help support and donate money to uh, the Unistonian camp. Um, so we'll put that up there and help sort of recuperate some of their court costs as well, because those are costly. Um, also, if you could, uh, for many of you guys, if you guys can join uh, the OFL as well, um, to, at the powerformany.ca, there's an opportunity and a link there that you can join and become a member and get part of the newsletter. 
Um, we're sort of coming down to the very end uh, of this talk. Uh, I want to thank uh, Saul, Eve, and Ron for taking the time uh, to be with us. And um, if we can, I'll sort of throw out a final question, sort of if you guys wrap up some final thoughts, it'd be great because I think it's really sort of important. Um, how can they cheat us? Uh, how can they cheat and so sorry, I lost my line here. Someone moved in here. One second, sorry. The internet moves faster than I can. There we go. Um, how is it that we can sort of get pushed to the side? How, why, how does that sort of happen? And, and, and I wanted to sort of get your perspectives on why, why, did, why does that happen? How do we always end up sort of on the sidelines having to look in on our own territory? And how can we sort of um, get people, again, involved cohesively um, shouting in one voice, as Ron said, uh, uh, mobilizing and, 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 and fighting and taking what is rightfully ours, as you said, and then working within the structure and, and, and not be afraid of having all eyes on us, like Sol said, um, so that we can push our rights to the forefront and we can sort of maintain our inherent rights to these territories, which are, which are ours since time immemorable. Um, Steve, would you like to start us off? Um, sure. Um, okay, sorry, what was the question again? The Sorry, yeah. So how can we sort of get people moving together? How do we, how do we do that? Sort of in a final thought. Oh. I really want to leave this on a, on a, on a positive note. <laughs> oh, okay, I remember. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, from what I notice, it's, um, it does have to do with like consistency. What I've been noticing is like, um, you know, uh, supporting what's happening at the moment because I know that, um, you know, with Suetin and Shut Down Canada, like, you know, was big on fire and then all of a sudden, boom, pandemic, cut, right? Like just everything got cut, our support, everything went to the pandemic. And then the BLM, that happened and then, so it seems to be like, um, you know, as these matters arise and um, it's just also like um, trying to keep it up, but also like in a respectful way because, right, we do got to share space with one another and support one another. And um, I think it's just like, everybody does have to have their rest time too, especially doing the work, um, because people can get burnout, etc. Um, you know, so it's just, um, just trying to uh, keep the conversations going like this, having, having talks and um, screening, uh, creative events, just whatever. And I think also like media too, media like has a way of spinning spinning the word or the narrative around and um there are some um there are some like when my my dad went into talks with carolyn bennett and mac miller and then so the media was like an agreement was made between cgl and the hereditary chiefs and that was totally <laughs> false and that just cut a lot of like oh okay like people a lot of people were wondering Right. So it's just keeping people updated and informed on what's going on and um, hearing from what's going on on the ground, too, with these issues. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I think just keeping the um, keeping it current and updated and constant. Well, as constant as it can. And there are actually three camps. Um, Una Stodin and then uh, Yinta Access, that's Gidimden uh, camp, and um, Lixemsu. So there are three different um, camps to support, which is cool. Thank you very much. That's good to know. Um, Saul, would you like to have some final words? Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, Perhaps uh, just a quick word, a uh, quick thank you to, uh, that it's an honor as well to be here with Ron and Eve and uh, you know, to be here with you. And I know that, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, our communities um, need to start and demand change now. 
just because I say that just because of the way it's at right now with respect to uh, you know uh, what's happening across the globe uh, with with the BLM and also indigenous issues with uh, you know the, the systemic racism that exists like the time is now. And I know one of the things for me, uh, I hear lip service, I hear uh, these, uh, and I think it's important that we do not accept any more lip service, any more lip service of reconciliation talk from, uh, uh, you know, uh, government officials or people that, you know, that just don't have, don't just talk but have no action. And it doesn't mean anything to us. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, we need to be able to have political action now. And I know they can address these issues that are impacting the communities, whether it's provincially, territorially, or federally, but they just have to have the will. And right now, you know, at all levels of government pertaining to any of the uh, indigenous issues that are in the forefront, there's no will, there's no political will. And uh, I think also we need to be able to provide, you know, action to restore hope and begin to build futures. We can all be proud of people as, you know, as Ontarians, as Canadians, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think it is a time to start looking at, you know, uh, our inherent rights as First Nations people, as Indigenous people. And also to consider our, uh, our voices, our values, you know, as rights holders in our territories. And we, the government, we need to call the government that to stop excluding us from these processes that are in place. So, and I think, uh, and that's the talents that we have. We have these barriers, systemic barriers, you know, month in, month out, you know, uh, and I recognize always the resilience of our people. I always recognize the, the strength of our people. And, and uh, most importantly as, as well is hope that our, our people have. And I think that's where we need to go. Ron, any Ron. final words? Yeah, you know what is, is as we sit down, we heard Eve talk about the media. You know, the, the big media inside this country is owned by four major uh, stakeholders and they're big business who take care of big business, who take care of politics. And we're seeing it inside of Alberta and, and other places. But you know, we need to keep that in mind. But you know, us as indigenous people need to stand up and we need to take leadership roles. You know, as we sit down, we see, you know, Saul doing it, you know, as I've been on the Canadian council with the uh, Canada Labour Congress and every time there's a, sp a place for me to speak is I speak, you know, and you know, sometimes it's, you know, eyes rolled because I take the mic too often, but I'm talking about indigenous issues and I'm gonna continue to is uh, when we talk about the Cattle Labour Congress, uh, which, you know, the Ontario Federation is, is part of, and, you know, my Yukon Federation is, is we represent some three million people. And the uh, courses such as Turtle Island and, and those types of Indigenous rights courses, you know, these are things that we need to stand up for, you know, is we need to be getting up and we need to be sending out, you know, inf information to members about what's going on with the uh, communities, because that's where real change is gonna start. As far as outside of, uh, outside of that, let's go out, you know, us as individuals, let's support, let's stand up. When there's something going on, you know, is, is let's go down and, and support what's going on with the indigenous communities. You know, whether it be in uh, Wet'suwet'en, you know, wh whether it be, you know, what's happening inside of Saskatchewan, you know, with the, ongoing in, you know, the uh, starlight tours that keeps on coming up, you know, whether it be something inside of your community, because I think, you know, there's, there's something inside of every one of our communities that's going on with Indigenous people and showing up, so standing up and showing support is really what I think is going to come out of this. And when we hit an election, 
we need to be out there and we need to be voting and we need to be explaining why. So yeah, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, it's, it, it really is a, uh, uh, an interesting time and we've seen indigenous people stand up. We're taking back our heritage. We're taking back our rights and we're gonna stand and we're gonna fight. And you know, even if it be you know, us being arrested inside of their system, we're gonna do so. So thank you very much. So just to wrap everything up, a huge big wish to all the panel panelists, Sol, Eve, and Ron for taking the time out on this uh, beautiful Saturday um, to come speak about sort of uh, all the Indigenous issues that have, you know, plagued Canada since its confederation. Um, you know, and West Sudan is just the, the latest thing that is going down, but there is stuff happening all over uh, Turtle Island and, and what is uh, colonial Canada. Um, with that said, I did have uh, tobacco ties uh, prepared for every single one of you. Um, if you don't mind, I will put them in the fire for you and, and, and say a quick word uh, to the creator. Uh, I want to give you again a, my sincerest of miigwetch from Nipsing First Nation. Uh, the power of many, the OFL power of many, and the OFL's uh, FNMI uh, Aboriginal Circle for joining us today through the airwaves. I'd like to thank all the attendees as well for uh, being here and listening to the panelists talk. I hope uh, this has given you guys some drive uh, to be a voice and to take back what is, uh, which is Indigenous territories across Canada um, and make sure that we are in the, in the limelight uh, whenever we can. Also be aware that we will be making a link on the powerofmany.ca website where you can donate money uh, to the uh, Unistoten camps uh, so that they can pay some of their legal bills and continue on the big fight uh, against big oil and big, uh, big gas. So a huge miigwetch again to everybody for coming in and I hope you guys have a great rest of your Saturday. Miigwetch. Miigwetch. Bye. Bye.